Well, Dr. Jensen, great to have you back for part 10 of rewriting history, not rewriting biblical history, but rewriting people's ideas of history and showing really from genetics that this all fits with the biblical history in regard to human populations and ethnic groups and so on around the world. Now, this part, part 10, and I think you can get on for about another million parts, but I know we'll go on for a few more weeks yet, but the hidden history of Americans. So let me just read what you sent to me uh, to summarize this part. After Columbus arrived in the Americas, over 60 million Europeans, primarily Western Europeans, followed. But who were they? We take for granted that they were ethnically Germans and Italians and Irish and the like. But genetics tells us a very different story and takes us back to one of the most mysterious epochs of European history, the Dark Ages. Tune in to find out the hidden history of Americans. This sounds rather intriguing. Now, I know in future episodes, because I've also said this, that you're going to go back and look at pre-Columbus. Now you're going to look at post-Columbus. So why don't you take it from here and tell us all about the hidden history of Americans? This will probably be the episode that hits the most close to home for many of our viewers. So many of our viewers would be here in the States, many of Caucasian descent. If we think about other viewers, perhaps English speakers in Australia, UK, Europe, these are primarily Western Europeans. And so this deals with Western European descent, which is heavy the history of the Americas and heavy the history of Europe. So that all that to say, we're gonna talk about things that are directly relevant probably to most of our viewers this time around. And the things we take for granted, so we, we didn't start with Western Europeans, but hopefully we've seen in the episode so far that the things we take for granted often turn out not to be true, so that if I destroy in this episode our viewers' dearly held ethnicities and stereotypes, perhaps they will uh, be prepared for it having seen the previous episodes. This is all part of the larger question of who do we come from? This is stuff history books can't tell you, haven't been able to tell you, because this is history from genetics, and we haven't had genetic tools until recently. And we haven't had these data to tell us the answers from genetics until the last five years. These are things I wouldn't have been able to tell you five years ago, things that have rewritten how I understand human history. This is data you're going to find in this place. You can't get it through commercial genetic testing companies. You can take some of what they tell you and then apply what you're learning here. But these conclusions are unique to, to this program. We're also going to look at the relationships between us and the ancients. I used to think I had no connection to these ancient cultures that we talk about in history books. I'm half German. My dad's American going back several generations. So why would I care about the ancient Egyptians other than their subject of study? Well, now I'm learning there's connections far more than I thought previously existed. So let's begin. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And then what? What happened after Columbus? We intuitively know the answer because the the answers, the clues are all around us. I lived in Boston, Massachusetts for six years. I knew that when I wanted to get some good Italian food, we'd go to the North End because the North End was the Italian American section of Boston with delicious Italian food. And it's not just Boston. Many big cities have little Italy's. This is from New York. And I don't know what city you're watching in, but there's a, there's a good chance you've got an Italian American section of town. Boston also has a strong Irish population, has St. Paddy's Day parades. And it's not just the Irish, who are, it's, not, it's not just Boston where the Irish are, they're in other cities. I'm sure you've had other similar celebrations in places around the country. I had Polish friends in Boston. This is a picture of Polish Hill in Pittsburgh. Now, even if I wasn't of, from a German mother, I grew up in Wisconsin. And if you go to Wisconsin or Chicago, or some other Midwestern place in October, you're likely to run into an Oktoberfest because there's a strong German and Scandinavian immigrant influence in these places. So what happened after Columbus? Well, a whole bunch of Europeans came over, right? Well, that's how we've often thought about it. And what we're going to discover is, once again, genetics rewrites what it means to be European or to, to parrot a, a famous movie we keep using that word European, but I don't think it means what we think it means. At least genetics tells us that. The world is smaller than we think. We saw this in episode one. There's more connections than we've imagined. Our family trees are more connected than we think because of the math of our number of ancestors. This implies that racial or ethnic change happens much more quickly than we think. And if we look at slight differences in reproductive rates, this is not intuitive, 
but it's mathematically the way it works out. A slight difference in reproductive rate can lead to one ethnicity taking over the other, even though this other ethnicity never looks any different. You can have Europeans that look like me, but have recent African ancestry from dark-skinned people. We've seen our family tree is much more shorter, much more shallow than we think. It's only 200 generations or less from Noah, eight people to the nearly 8 billion alive today. And so to, it's, it's 200 genealogical steps. So to, to compress going back in time, 8 billion back down to eight, very easy. It just happens really fast. And so you're gonna have to start putting people groups together to do it. And we've seen that the only way we can do this genetically is not with the commercial genetic tests. You pay $100 to ancestry DNA, to 23andMe, family tree DNA. And the readout that you get tells you, well, you're this percent German, this percent Irish. <laughs> it's probably very little from what you already know from your own family tree. And the reason for that is they're looking at the DNA that comes from both parents. And so if dad is Irish and mom is German, the kids are half of each of those. And then it gets diluted by another half, 12, uh, so 50%, 25%, 12.5%. .5%. On down it goes, boom, 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 it drops off. And so these sorts of genetic tests can only go back four or five generations, which you probably already know from looking into your family tree. So $100, hopefully not wasted, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot more than what you already know. It's the DNA from one parent that can tell you much deeper history. On the mother's side, it's mitochondrial DNA. It's statistically noisy, which is why we haven't looked at it in depth. It tells you 6,000 years ago is when it started, but you can't get into the fine, precise details. It's the male inherited DNA for reasons, I guess, that God intended that gives us the much more detailed resolution of who we came from. And that's what we've been focusing on, beginning with one of the first branches that connected Europe to South Asia, India, in the recent past. They have had common ancestors. They, that common ancestor population split up around the 1500s. And we've seen that it's likely the Mongols and their descendants who have infiltrated Eastern Europe. Central Asia, Middle East, and India. It's very explicit in India. The Mughal Empire, the ruling empire before the British came, was of Mongol descent. And we can see this reflected. About 25% of Indians today, South Asians, are of this descent, about a third of Eastern Europe. Last time we looked at the ancient Chinese connection to modern Europe, we saw that there's another third of Europe that's connected to Siberian, other Central Asian connected people groups who themselves were intermixing with China. And looks like going back to the, to the distant history, the deep history, shared a common ancestor with the dominant people group in China today, the dominant genetic group in China today. And this has eventually resulted in intermixing among these Central Asians and Russians and other Eastern Europeans. What we want to look at today is the other half of the European equation. So about two thirds of Eastern Europeans have recent Central Asian ancestry. They don't look like it. They don't look like Central Asians. They look like Europeans, Caucasians. Yet this is what the genetics say. Now we want to look at the history of Western Europeans, the other half of Europe. Who settled the Americas after Columbus? We've got the clues all around us. The Irish, the Germans, the, the French, the Spanish, the Italians. This is what we think of as the dominant ethnicities in the New World. There's a hidden history in all this. And the ancestors of most Americans, and by extension then Western Europeans, are not who you think they are. After Columbus arrived in 1492, over 75 million immigrants arrived on the shores of the Americas. Now, some were forced there. Part of the sad, one of the saddest chapters in human history, the ugliest chapters, is the forcible enslavement and removal of 11 million Africans from the African continent to the New World to, to work under awful conditions in slave labor on plantations. So they represent some of the immigrant population, in a sense, to the New World. Forced immigration. Sad chapter. In terms of Caucasian Americans, thinking from north to south, about 9 million people from the British Isles arrived in Canada. Around half or so of those eventually ended up in the United States, but there's the data for our northern neighbor if you're watching from the United States. A whopping 42 million arrived in the United States, primarily from Western Europe. About 40% of these people arrived from the British Isles, 20% from Germany and Scandinavia, 20% from some of the Mediterranean countries like Spain and Portugal and a heavy Italian influence, of course. And then 20% from Eastern Europe, which I'm including Poland, Russia, Ukraine, these sorts of countries in that, in that quantity. Latin America, of course, draws heavily 
from Spain and Italy. They don't have nearly the number of migrants. Of course, the dominant languages in Latin America are Spain and uh, Spanish and Portuguese. I've only highlighted Brazil and Argentina here because they were the recipients of the heaviest numbers of Spanish and Italians. They don't, you, you don't see nearly the same numbers as for the US because they came over and then the, the people we see today are largely the result of natural increases in these countries. So there's, there's a group that came over, they intermingled with the people that were here. And so the Latin Americans you see today are, are heavily European, but it's primarily because they've been in that location, increasing naturally in that spot. The numbers are less influenced by continuous migration from the European continent. Well, if you add up all these numbers together and say, okay, looking up and down the Americas, what parts of Europe do people come from? I've divided Europe into the, to the darker yellow, orangish color, that's Western Europe. France is part of it too, but I, I haven't highlighted them as much. And the lighter yellow is Eastern Europe. A whopping 86% of Americans, Caucasian Americans, in terms of their immigrant history, come from Western Europe. Eastern Europe is a much smaller influence. So what does it mean to be a Western European, and by extension then, a Caucasian American. I want to take a 30,000 foot very quick review of Western European history to see what politics tells us and then we'll take a deep dive into the genetics to see how it revises this. I'm going to start with the Roman Empire about 100 years after the time of Christ. This is AD 117. Roman Empire exists in the British Isles, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, the Balkan Peninsula. They're in parts of Asia, namely up here in Turkey and the Middle East. They're also of course in North Africa. This eventually splits into Eastern and Western halves. The Western half is overthrown by the invasions of Germanic barbarians and Central Asian peoples like the Huns. The Eastern Roman Empire hangs on for another thousand years as the Byzantine Empire until it's overthrown in the 1400s. I think it's the Ottoman Empire. Well, this invasion of the Western European Roman Empire leads, I, I was taught, you were probably taught in school, plunges Europe into the Dark Ages which we're learning more about, but they were called the Dark Ages, I was taught, because we know so little about them. Yes, the Vikings raided Northern Europe, you have Scandinavian raiders in the British Isles, Northern France, so forth. But really, this is largely unfamiliar territory. Even if I were to show you maps of Europe at this time, it's not something that really rings a bell. And yellow is the Holy Roman Empire, not a terribly famous one per se, for casual observers of Western European history. In the East and purple, it's the Roman Empire, again, we don't usually call it that. We tend to think of it as the Byzantine Empire, and naturally our minds don't connect to that. And you can see it's heavily Asian, not so much European. This is AD 814. Here's another view of that same year. You can see again the Frankish Empire. There's parts of the British Isles that look more familiar, but down here it's the Muslims who are in Spain due to the Arab Muslim conquests. Italy is broken up into component parts. There's a Bulgarian Empire down here. Again, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire is over here, not so much familiar territory. Eventually, Europe emerges from these dark ages into the Middle Ages. Think knights and castles and cities enclosed in walls, like this is Rotenburg, sort of a relic of a bygone era, being of German descent. This is in Germany, been able to visit a few times, fascinating insights into how Europe used to look. This gives way to the Renaissance, rediscovery of classical learning, people like Leonardo da Vinci, and scientific advances. There's an earthquake in the religious realm with the Protestant Reformation, whose effects ripple throughout Europe. Though politically by the 1600s, mid 1600s, there's big chunks of Europe that are still unfamiliar to our eyes. Yes, you've got Spain and Portugal down here. France is beginning to take its modern shape. England, Scotland, Ireland, those are familiar. But in the East, the Ottoman Empire is ruling the Balkans, Muslim Empire. Italy is broken up into a whole bunch of different kingdoms. Germany is a mess. Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, not quite so similar to what we see today. So even late in Western European history, there's significant differences to the map we take for granted today. What we're gonna soon discover is that those dark ages, those mysterious, that mysterious period of Western European history shrouded in mystery contains one of the most important episodes that gives rise to the identity that we call Europe. The Thousand Genomes Project is the study we've been focusing heavily upon. They look at 26 populations of people around the globe. I want to revisit what the genetics tell us about these Western European entities and some of the peoples as well 
in the new world. So this is the family tree that results from some of these folks. I took about half of them to keep it simple. We've looked at this branch up here that I've called R1A. And just to clarify, because I've gotten some, some feedback that tells me I, I didn't explain it very clearly the first time. I'm showing here on this tree a bunch of dark green South Asians, Indians, Pakistanis, so forth, coming together to a common ancestor with Europeans. This does not mean that every single South Asian Asian in this tree, in this particular branch of the tree, or every single European in this branch of the tree comes together right there. I said this, this section it represents, this, this branch of the tree, this major branch called R1A, represents a full 25% of India. What that doesn't mean is that there's hundreds of millions of Indians who have this one guy as their common ancestor. They're, they go back to several people along this branch. 1500 is when whoever this people group was, I think it's Mongols, they split. And we looked at some of the political events that led to that. So for this particular subgroup of 20 to 50 men, their ancestor is right there. And it's representative of what we see in these particular people groups. It's a third of Eastern Europe. I'm, again, this is R1A. I mentioned those names not to throw out a bunch of scientific lingo. But these are the types of designations you'll likely see if you take a genetic test and ask for Y chromosome analysis. So you can look back at these videos and say, aha, this is who I come from, because you're not going to find that out from these commercial companies. They don't use the Young Earth time scale. They use the mainstream time scale, in which they miss many of these historical echoes. We're going to drop down just a little bit below that R1A branch to R1B. So again, the naming convention gives us a clue to where we're at. It's part of the major group we call R. It's the subgroup 1, but a subbranch of 1 is R1B. So it's just right below it. It tells you sort of where you are physically on this tree. You can see there's a lot of gold. There's a blue branch, Royal Blue East Asian, and a green South Asian branch. My guess is these are echoes of the Mongols. It's just a very small fraction, and we're not going to spend any more time on it today. The major separation, though, and flowering of this part of the tree, you can see is in AD 1300 or so, 1400, depending on which study you look at. I want to zoom in here so you can see exactly who's present. Again, we're going to ignore these guys up here for the time being. You can see, though, a lot of Spanish, Italians, British, some Finnish, British, Italians. There's a lot of Western Europeans present in this part of the tree. Again, every branch represents a single individual, a single man, going back then to the 1300s. And again, if you look at more of this tree, you'd eventually find some other branches coming off or leading to these Europeans. I want to focus here on the point at which they diverge and move away from other people groups and when they first start to flower in terms of their numbers. This is R1B. And this is a, a notation many of you, if you've taken genetic tests, likely have already seen because it represents 60% of Western Europe. And since the Caucasian American population derives by and large almost exclusively from Western Europe, there's a whole bunch of Americans who are going to show up in this branch as well. And I'm going to show you this is true in this study as well. This particular Thousand Genomes Project focused on Latin American peoples, so Mexicans in Los Angeles, Puerto Ricans, Colombians in the city of Medellin, and Peruvians in the city of Lima. Well, if you look at their genetics, you can see some of this echo. On one hand, it's very sad. We'll get into the sad side of this in future episodes. I want to focus on the European side. The sad side is, even though these are Latin Americans, they're, you, you think these might have a Native American ancestry, on, in terms of their male heritage, only about 20% of them look like they came from Amerindians, Native Americans. Another 6% look like they come from Africans. So there's been mixing from the people who came from the slave trade and mixed with these Latin Americans. Nearly three-fourths of these people have obvious European ancestry. And guess which branch, which European branch of the tree these Latin Americans show up in? So if 60% of Western Europe is R1B, lo and behold, no surprise, 60% of Latin Americans show up in this branch as well. The math lines up, shows their Western European heritage. Now, I want to draw your attention to a group that I haven't focused on so much before. I've shown them in France right there. They're people of French heritage, but they were actually residing in Utah at the time of the study. So they represent Caucasian Americans, and 86% of them show up in this branch R1B. So if you want to understand the history of Western Europe, the history of Caucasian Americans, this is the place to look, by and large. So what does genetics tell us about who they come from? Who do I Statistically, it's, I'm probably in this branch. Who do I come from? Who does Ken come from? Well, in the Thousand Genomes Project, if you take a look backwards, you see a long blank line with no one coming off of it, basically, for th a thousand years. So this doesn't really answer the question. To, to get some more clues as to 
who it is we come from, we have to switch to this other study that took a dive into a, a broader swath of ethnicities, heavy Eastern Europeans, but they've got Central Asians, they've got Middle Easterners, Siberians, more East Asian people groups, not so many Native Americans. Could this give us a clue? R1B shows up in this tree as well, right there, because this is heavily Eastern Europe. It's not nearly as many people as we saw in the previous branch. And I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see the individual, individuals momentarily. Again, they focus on Eastern Europe. Eastern Europeans are in these other branches, R1A and N, heavily two thirds of them, so you don't see so many in R1B. Ukrainians, Jews that were living in Europe, Germans, Mordvins, not so many. There's some, some in red here is what we call Middle Eastern or Near Easterners. They're largely people in the Caucasus region, mountains sort of north of Iraq that used to be part of the USSR, Armenians, uh, Avars, Assyrians who were up there as well. I'm not gonna spend time on these because they're fairly close to Europe. And uh, that's another story for another day. What I wanna focus on is the clues that were given in the earlier parts of the branches. So in the Thousand Genomes Project, this was just one long blank line. In this particular study, because they have more ethnicities, they also have Central Asians, which are becoming a familiar theme now if you've been watching this series. There are Tajiks, Tajikistan, those Stans from the former Russian Republic it's in, in Central Asia. There's Mongolians that come off here. These are Bashkirs, Eastern Europeans, former Russian republics. And we can put dates on this. And I wanna emphasize again, probably do this every episode when we talk about dates, this is work in progress, research in progress. These dates may change somewhat. I'm going with the data that we have at the moment and my best guess for where Noah is just so we can have a conversation. AD 450 is when the Tajik branch comes off. And this branch right here in which there's Mongolians comes off in AD 850. Now, at this point, we've got two possibilities. We can say this could be one long indigenous European branch who because of Russian expansion, eventually got into Tajikistan and intermixed with the Mongols. I'm suspicious that this is not the case. For one, you don't have very many Russians in R1B. This is a Western European branch. So I have a tougher time connecting the historical events of the Russian expansion to this Western European branch. Instead, what this appears to me to be is historically a Central Asian lineage that by 850 or later broke away and came into Western Europe. Well, the most recent date we have for this split is 850. The early one is 450. That puts you smack in the most mysterious part of Western European history, the Dark Ages. So what if any connections were there between Europe, forget Western Europe, just Europe period, and Central Asia during this time? And if you would have asked me three months ago, I would have said, I have no idea, or a year ago, no idea. I had to look this up. This is not something we typically learn about in school. And lo and behold, if you look it up, there is a whopping amount of activity and movement of peoples from Central Asia into Europe. And the more I've studied this, the more I've realized there's almost a continuous stream of Central Asian peoples moving into Europe. Last episode, we saw how the geography of China has made it protected and isolated. Europe, in a sense, is protected and isolated too. It's got the Saharan Desert and water down here to protect from invasions from the south. And you don't see, in, if you look in history, any sub-Saharan African peoples coming through the desert, going into Europe, or really vice versa. No Europeans come down and try to conquer sub-Saharan Africa. There's a big barrier there called the Saharan Desert. You don't really read of anything in history up until the modern era of Europeans going across the Atlantic or Native Americans coming this way. It's a big barrier to migration and invasion. The Arctic and water up here prevents that. Where Europe is exposed is in the east. It's flat and open. And all these Central Asians can march right in if they want to. And they did. The Khazars in the 500s, again, I'm, I'm going to give a whole bunch of unfamiliar names here just so you are aware of the different groups that came in. Probably not familiar though, and this is not for memorization. The Pechenegs came in. You can see the dates there. The Oghuz, Turkish people. And this is something I've had to in, in which I had to correct my underlying assumptions on, I think, oh, Turkish, that must mean modern Turkey. Historically, the Turkish people came from here. And if you look at Turkish languages, you can still find a, a, a band of them this way. The, the Turks in modern Turkey is, is really a recent, due to recent historical events that we'll get to in future episodes, especially when we talk about the history of the Jews and of the Middle Eastern peoples. 
So the Oguz, the Turkish people are coming in. And I, if I, I have to double check this, but I think Khazars are Turkish speaking people as well. Kipchaks are coming in. And the last people group that I wanna highlight are the Magyars, not necessarily Turkish speaking. We're gonna talk about language connections here in a moment, but they came in around the time, given the data that we have, at that split 850s so the 800s is, is close to when the Magyars are migrating from Central Asia this way as part of their conquest. So notice most of these arrows are still landing in Eastern Europe. I'll talk about why I think this may have a connection to Western Europe in a moment. The Magyars are one of the few who actually militarily made ventures into Western Europe and then eventually settled in what we call modern Hungary. Another reason I wanna highlight the Magyars is because unlike the other groups, some of whom spoke Turkish languages, the Magyars spoke a, a Hungarian essentially, or a, a, an ancestor of it, they spoke a language that falls into the Hungarian language family, and the Hungarian language family still exists today. Let me explain this map very quickly, just so you, we, we can follow the point I'm trying to make. So I'm trying to make the point that many of these other groups don't seem to have much of a language signature today. The Magyars do. Most of Europe, this light green, is what we call uh, speakers of the Indo-European language. So just a, a real brief lesson in, in the history of languages. I've mentioned in this episode or previous episodes that there's 7,000 languages today, Genesis 10, which I think are the, the major groups present at Babel when God separates people, only number around 70. So there's been a massive explosion in languages since Babel. God did the initial split right there. And so there's really, a, in a sense, a, an analogy to when we think about species, animal species. We say species is not the creative kind, not genus, but family. In a similar sense, languages within a family probably come from that common ancestor at Babel. And so even though there's Spanish, French, and Italian that are Romance languages, and there's Ger German and English that are Germanic languages, we're all part of this larger Indo-European language family, dominant one in Europe as well. Another branch of this family is the Slavic language group, you think of Russian and so forth. Well, there's an exception here, and that's the Finno-Ugric language family into which Hungarian, uh, Finnish and other ones and other minority languages in Russia belong. The Magyars were members of this language family. And so even though you may have never heard of them, they still have an echo of their existence in languages to this day. That's my main point right here, is that there's been a strong, long stream of Central Asian peoples moving into Europe. This predates the Mongols. It's around the time of the Dark Ages. And they seem to be good candidates for explaining this R1B branch that ended up dominating Western Europe and then by extension, the Americas. Well, why would I say people who move into Eastern Europe became the ancestors of Western Europeans? Well, continue the historical narrative further. This is the, go back to the slide, the 500s, 800s, 1000s, 200 years later, you've got some Mongols that sweep into here and dominate this part of the world. And my guess is they push whoever was here at the time this way. Now you might say, well, the dark green is only right here. Why would you call all of Western Europe? Well, there's a, there, there's a basic fact that I've had to remind myself of over and over again. You can change your language, you can't change your genetics. Easiest way to see this is think of the Americas. You've got people of African descent, African-Americans genetically, obviously of African descent, yet they don't speak African languages. They've had to learn and been forced to learn Spanish, Portuguese, English, French, so forth. You can change your language, can't change your genetics. So language is, in my view, more a reflection of politics and so they've survived politically. But genetics can tell you a totally different story, just like what we see in the Americas with African-Americans. So it's, it's very plausible that you can have someone who is here, who has got a very small language signature, eventually connecting all these people. And remember as well, even though Spanish, French, German, English are all separate unintelligible languages to the native speakers of each, Genetically, all this disappears, going back just a few hundred years. So my guess is, if it is the Magyars, and, and, and I'm not convinced yet that it is, they seem like the best candidate at this point, the Mongols came in and displaced whoever was here on the border with the Mongol empires, and, and they became the ancestors here of everyone else. One other thing to consider, a seismic event that postdates both the Mongol invasion and the earlier Magyar and other invasions. The Black Death sweeps through Europe in the 1300s. Mongols come in the 1200s. 
huge effect on Europe. There's debate on exactly how many Europeans died. Some, some, what I've tended to read is around a third of Europeans died. Well, given how much Central Asian ancestry we've seen already in Europe, and given the fact that the Black Death came from Central Asia, so we've seen a lot of Central Asian ancestry in Europe, the Black Death comes from Central Asia, could those people who had Central Asian descent at that time been protected from the Black Death so that the indigenous Europeans felt the heavier blow? It's a hypothesis we can hopefully eventually test, but that may also be a factor at play how a group that has a small language signature today and came originally into Eastern Europe may eventually come to dominate Western Europe. You'll have to see episodes one through four to see some of the other biological factors by which this could very easily happen. I'm saying that these are some of the other sort of cultural, political, biological factors that may be something to consider as well, whatever the explanation is. And, the, and it may eventually be as we get more data that the Western Europeans are also descendants of Mongols. I don't favor that hypothesis strongly right now because of the geography of where the Mongols were versus the geography of what we're talking about now, mainly Western Europe. Whatever the exact people group is, we know that R1B, I would argue that R1B looks like it's Central Asian in origin. And let me throw out one other thing to consider, something we've learned from looking at how Genghis Khan conducted his Mongol conquests. He started by conquering other Central Asian peoples. And to maintain loyalty among the peoples he conquered, and he recruited people to his army from these peoples, he deliberately divided them up. So maybe you're not Mongol, but you're Central Asian, you're part of this group. Well, I'm going to take some of your men and put them in this division, some in this division, some in this division, so that whatever ethnic loyalties you have are dissolved, and now you're loyal to me. And my guess is that's not something unique to the Mongols. The Central Asians are constantly on the move. And so what it means to be Mongol may, in fact, be a whole mix of lineages. And what it means to be Magyar may also be a whole mix of lineages, so that defining these precise distinctions distinctions to which we place heavy linguistic, cultural, political value on them, may not, be, fi may not find as much of an echo at the genetic level. So regardless of which specific Central Asian ethnicity Western Europeans come from, to me the evidence points to those people, whoever they are in Central Asia, being the dominant ancestors of Western Europeans as well. That seems to be what it means to be European, not necessarily of Roman ancestry, of Greek ancestry, but of Central Asian ancestry. So to put together what we've seen over the last several episodes, we saw that this branch R1A, which looks to me strongly like it's Mongol in origin, whatever Mongol means, it's Central Asian, is a third of Europe. This N branch, which is heavy in Siberia and has been intermingling with East Asia, another third of Eastern Europe. R1B is close to two thirds of Western Europe, plus the dominant group in the Americas. What we're now seeing is that the majority of Europeans and now of Americans, the hidden ancestry of Americans is Central Asian. So one of the things I promised early on was to show you that most Europeans have reached an Asian ancestry. You've now seen in genetics deliver this. It's not how we think about ourselves. I don't look at me in the mirror and say, I'm an Asian, because I don't think I look Asian, but this is what the genetics tells us is the ancestry. There's many more connections among the people groups alive today than we think, and often in ways we didn't expect to see. This is the new history of the human race, and there's even more surprises in store. In the next few episodes, we're gonna spend a lot of time on the other side of the Columbian divide. We've looked at post-Columbian events. In the future, we're gonna look at pre-Columbian events, one of the biggest black boxes, even among mainstream scientists. There's some real shocks in store when we look at the genetics there. Well, Dr. Jensen, this is uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. And you know, it, it really does bring it home that we are so much more closely related than we realize to break down those barriers of racism and prejudice that exist and, and to realize too that, um, hey, when you even look at movements like white supremacy and so on, it's, it's just nonsense when it comes to understanding our true history here. And so you're throwing some fascinating insights and you're using genetics to actually confirm uh, biblical history. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us all the different things that happened. It just gives us the big picture, obviously, and some of those uh, major events like the Tower of Babel and those language families. But then over time, of course, within each family, as you said, like sort of 
you know, akin to speciation in a way. You get all these different variations, dialects, and so on. Uh, and so we see that, and it really is uh, incredible. So look forward to parts 11 and 12 next week. And what will they cover? Is that going to be the pre-Columbian history? This is our, our first forays into pre-Columbian history. We'll talk about some of the revolutions, even in mainstream science. It's, it's hard even for mainstream scientists to keep track of all that's changing. One of the books we'll be discussing is written by a guy who took history in the 70s and had been attending archaeological conferences, wrote a book to try to summarize what he's learned, but he said, you can't write a textbook on this. If you got to the end of writing your textbook, you'd have to change the beginning. Things are changing that fast in how we understand who we came from. And once we apply genetics to it with the biblical time scale, we're going to see the echo of post-Columbian history in the Americas which is something evolutionists cannot see, that leads to a gigantic monkey wrench in all of these conclusions, pre-Columbian, in a way that's extremely interesting and may actually be a key to understanding some of the long-standing pre-Columbian mysteries like what happened to the Maya. They collapsed around the eight, nine hundreds, and mainstream scientists give as many explanations for that as they do for the demise of the dinosaurs. So there's some really interesting correlations between the genetics I'll be showing and some of these mysteries, even Wikipedia, I think, calls the demise of the Maya one of the great unsolved archaeological mysteries. This is what we have in store in the coming episodes. And I imagine that the genetics you're studying is not going to be well received by certain politicians because their political views don't fit with what the genetics is, is going to tell us. Yes, and especially on this, this Native American question, it's sticky politically, it's a sensitive ethnic question. What I'm going to start with, though, is before we start rewriting people's cherished identities or histories, let's start with what we know. And what we know the best, because we have written history, is what happened after Columbus. And I'll show that we, creationists, are one of the only people who can actually recapitulate what we know about the post-Columbian history. And this tells us what we're doing is working, because we can take history that even the evolutionists recognize. Yeah, that, that's what happened in the Americas after Columbus. We'll say, look, I can recapitulate that. You can't. And so therefore, what I'm going to tell you about the pre-Columbian history must therefore be true. Fascinating. Well, we look forward to part 11 next week and then part 12. And in the meantime, people can go to our Answers in Genesis YouTube channel and they can see the playlist there and follow through all the parts. So we've now done 10 of these. And of course, this is leading up to a book that will be published sometime in 2021. We look forward to seeing you for part 11, Dr. Jensen.